Uh, I just was hoping, I was hoping you were going to do that because I thought for a mo moment you were just asking me to say something interesting, which is <laughs> never that easy. <laughs> Over to you, Sanford. One thing you're not is yeah. boring, so you'll, you'll be fine. Oh, <laughs> well, watch out. What is up, everybody? I am Jason Trost, the host of the Business of Betting podcast. I'm really excited to have Sanford on the show today. He is somebody that I've known forever. He's, he's I, I'll let him introduce himself in a, in a minute, but he's kind of one of these people um, similar to Paul Beatty, similar to Quentin, where, you know, like totally behind the scenes, but knows everybody. He's been involved in so many different aspects of the industry for, for a long time. He's had such a great viewpoint for what's been going on in the industry. I'm, I'm very excited to kind of uh, let Sanford share some of the uh, learnings and, and, and perspectives that he had because he definitely has like, he's had a great vantage point in the industry. So, well, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that actually after the many years I've known you, I've just discovered how to say your surname. <laughs> Trost. Not Trost like most. <laughs> Exactly, Trost the host. So, uh, so do you want to introduce yourself and the lovely plants behind you? Sure. Don't don't test me on the plants. Okay. It's, it's just a plant. It's just a plant. Okay. Um, but happy to introduce myself. So, Sanford Lab. So, I run with my partner Daniel Burns an investment bank called Oakvale Capital, and we're an unusual investment bank in the sense that we specialize only on sports, gaming, and then free-to-play gaming, which includes console, mobile. And Dan and I have been working together for 11 or 12 years now. And I think we've carved out quite a unique in the industry. And over the last few years have been fortunate, but also I think, you know, let's hope there's some element of skill in, in being involved in most of the, the mega deals in the space and in particular, we, uh, we were relatively successful in doing a number of the SPACs. So we were the lead advisor on selling Betway to a SPAC. We were the lead advisor on Rush Street Interactive. We recently advised on the sale of Aspire Global. So we've been at the coalface of most of the major M&A deals and hopefully will continue to be so. But I think one of the reasons why I think we've been reasonably successful is because we also have the consultancy side. And that consultancy side involves running RFPs in the US to help select sports betting technologies. It involves digital advisory, which then bleeds into the M&A. Um, and it just allows us when we're sitting opposite a bulge bracket investment bank to be reasonably smart about the industry or hopefully so. So those are the two core pillars of the business that we have set up or have been running over our capital. And then we also have an investment side and have been super active over the last few years uh, in terms of investing in early stage, pre-IPO, uh, gaming, sports tech assets. I should also say everyone kind of thinks we're just gambling. We're not. We have that mobile game side. We've been super active on that front in the last few years. But also recently we've been involved in the sale of Chelsea. So we formed this fan consortium that was buyer agnostic. And at the moment we're involved in Formula One, some other Premier League deals, that kind of thing. So that we've branched out so you a little dabble. bit. You dabble. We dabble. We dabble. And how did you? What's your? What's like the the background? So I I don't think I know this. How did you get into this industry? Yeah, that's a, I don't think anyone intentionally gets into this industry, or certainly I didn't. Uh, I wasn't a massive gambler. I have since become more of a gambler, and I am a massive sports junkie. So love sports, any kind of sport, to the point that actually I just came off a call with a company I invest in called Fan Controlled Football, um, which I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically it is exactly what it says on the tin. It's an American football league where the fans can call the plays. And it's doing incredibly well. It's, it's, the engagements are pretty significant now and starting to build. So I say that just you to... You mean fans kind of can call the players that, like... Um, uh, uh, what's that, that site called... Uh, it does all the celebrity birthday things. 
Oh, I don't, I don't know that. But basically what it is, is you have fan engagement, fan power, so you can call the next player. And you, they play it on a smaller American football pitch. It's really interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's quite nuanced, but it's, it's intriguing. And so we're doing you know, a lot more around sports just because of my love of that. But how did I get into it? I was working in investment banking at one of the big bulge brackets, Sun Life Merrill Lynch, then went to another bank called Walshers Capital. And then I was I founded a, a carpooling business called Share to There, which later became Grallo, which which actually gravitated to the Indian market. And I met Daniel, who'd been working in Daniel Burns, who'd been working in gambling for forever. Um, and he said, I want to formalize the corporate finance side of what we do. And he formed a partnership with another guy called John Mendelssohn, who recently, I say recently, about four or five years ago, became a Labour peer and is now the chairman of 888, so is no longer involved. And so I joined them, started to kind of build out the corporate finance element. We sold Virgin Games to Gamesys originally, and then it all snowballed from there. Maybe, like, what do you think your secret sauce is to, to let you be a part of, like, all those deals? Like, what? Yeah, I, I don't want to be too boring about this, um, but... What we think we're good at is understanding the space inside out. Yes, clearly we have a pretty amazing network and you know, I guess I don't have kids so I can do this morning, noon and night, um, even if my wife does complain. But there was a lot of traveling in the early days and getting around the globe and building relationships. So I think one element is relationships, which Daniel has built for 20 years and I've built for 12 years. In fact, Daniel's probably built for longer than mm. that. And... The second element is the corporate finance backbone. So I think you can't do the M&A without having relatively sophisticated knowledge of, of how the markets work. You know, with these SPACs, there's so many different instruments you can use, especially now as we try and de spac one asset in particular. You can't just go and access the same group of fidelities and other funds that invest in these types of public businesses. You have to be so much more creative. And you have to come up with creative instruments that uh, a place to get shares or more like ATM instruments. So I think you need that investment banking, hardcore, sophisticated understanding of how these things work. So, and we have that within the firm and hopefully from my background as well. And then secondarily, we also have this consultancy skill set. So we hire a lot of people from BCG and, and consultancy firms like that. And I love consultants because actually... I think bankers are almost, and this is my training, I think bankers are actually educated to be a little bit robotic. You know, they they kind of take the information, regurgitate it, told what to do, whereas the consultants are much more analytical and actually have to add value to that information, not just get someone to tell them what a business does and then package it into a classic info memorandum. So we try and make sure, and I think our storytelling ability is actually what sets us apart. So you can see a lot of the public market debt we did for Rush Street, for Golden Nugget, for Genius Sports, for Betway, for Novabet more recently. I think they tell a story that others perhaps that a pure play investment banks can't do. So that that's what I think we're good at. And we're, and we're graphers as well. <laughs> like we're, we're hustlers. I mean, we, you know, I think you give a dog a bone and, and generally speaking, when we take on a mandate, we're pretty good at running down if you, if you if you were a dog, what kind of dog would you be? Oh, that is actually an incredibly good question because my father turned 80 recently. And I I got him two things. I got him season tickets at Chelsea and I got him a dog. I got him a Labradoodle, which was point blank refused by my mother and then consequently by my father. So... I've had to give the dog back, but my wife and I, if I could, my, the dog I would get, not necessarily the dog I would be, would be a Tibetan Mastiff. Yes. You've seen they these. Huge? They're 60 kilo, furry, cuddly dogs. I absolutely love them. I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I'd be one. I think, unfortunately, I'd probably be more like a sort of yappy Jack <laughs> Russell, but I like the Tibetan Mastiff. Uh, that's funny. For those in the audience that don't know the mechanics of, of a SPAC, why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit like how you set up a SPAC, um, why companies do it, and how that works? Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of a perfect example. What's happened in the last two and a half years is a really good example of perfect market economics. 
because you know some people who had the forward thinking to set up SPACs in let's say 19 and there, there were funds dedicated to SPACs before that it was just a, a small part of the space because everyone traditionally everyone thought of SPACs as a little bit spivvy but the the reality is that those that were the front were very successful because they could move quickly there was enough deal flow but essentially a SPAC is it's a special acquisition company and was historically called a cash shell you couldn't form them on London Stock Exchange. You can in the US. You also can in Amsterdam and a few other exchanges. But the US is the most prevalent place to do it. And essentially what you do is you list... And then when the SEC finally approves it, you do that. At that point, the trust investors decide whether they want to redeem or not. And in the early days, the trust investors, because they've got it. It's a one share and a partial warrant. And it could be 0.3 of a share or 0.5 or even one in the early days. And I consider myself quite financially literate, and, and some of these terms go way over my head. And I, I'm sure other people would really enjoy, especially because there's so many SPACs in this industry, like unpacking it in a little bit more of an understandable. So go back. So this, so basically, if, from my understanding with the SPAC, you get a pool of money, say 100 million, 300 million, sitting in a pot. Those are called the sponsors of the SPAC. They're not called the sponsors. So the sponsors are the people that set up. The vehicle. The, and the people I, that run the, the, the they're SPAC the sponsors company. And they get, yeah. I, exactly. The they're company. the board. They're the ones that are going to go and find the deal. Then the trust investors are the funds that invest into the trust, which is your 150, 200 million portion. And the beauty for them is they invest. They get a, and it depends on the deal, but normally it's, you know, as I say, one unit, one share plus a partial one. And the beauty of that is they can wait, they can sit it out, they can take, they basically don't need to invest that money if they don't like the deal. So that's what I was talking about in terms of redemption. So you get to the deal, you see that it's DraftKings and SP Tech, and you say, mm, I don't like the valuation or I don't like the combination, and you redeem. So it's a zero, well, it's a, yeah, it's a zero risk investment or commitment for funds to say I'm going to put 20 million into a trust. And you don't pay a fee if you don't redeem. Is there, an, is there a sweetener for redeeming? You, I guess the sweetener is the warrants, right? So for not, are you saying to, to incentivize non-redemption, there are lots of now ways we're coming up with mechanics to sweeten okay. the deal. So to get trust investors to sign non-redemption agreements, for example, you're coming up with additional warrants or transitioning some of the sponsor equity or you're delaying their ability to redeem and saying, well, you can continue to have the option to redeem one year down the track. So there's lots of different structures. And now there's a whole kind of myriad funds that have come out of the woodwork with these ATM instruments that allow companies that are despacking to access more capital if the share price goes up. Lots of very smart And what's, what's the $10 per share not. mechanism? Is that a convention or is there some legal reason for that? The convention and it's legally required that every every unit okay, is 10 Okay, it's just bucks. sort of the SEC rules or whatever. I don't know what the foundation of that is, but uh, one Okay, unit, and then can bucks. you talk about the difference between the people that put the money in on the trust level versus the pipe money? Yeah, and <laughs> the pipe market is debt. So pipe stands for uh, private investment in public equity. And it was always the way to corroborate the price of the deal that you've set up. And it gave comfort to the trust. But right now, the pipe market is pretty low ebb. And now what you're seeing is lots of structured credit. So convertibles, uh, coupons, downside protection. So the pipe happens after the deal is you announce the deal and you go on your pipe road show and essentially you go and speak to loads of funds, sell the story and they decide whether they want to invest in, in the business. Now that ordinarily was just common equity. These days, unfortunately, it has to have a lot more structure if you want to get okay. it. Okay. Let's, let's, let's use the Rush Street example um, because I think that was quite uh, famous in the industry and, uh, and successful at the time. So how many, how big was the trust of the, the trust of the SPAC that bought Rush Street? Yeah, so maybe um, what might be interesting, 
because you get bogged down in details and warrants and all these types of things is like, if I go back and I, I think I can say this, we started working with Rush Street in early 2020. In fact, actually, I think the last transatlantic trip I did was to Chicago in February where everyone was sort of thinking about COVID, but not that much. And so we were getting all the materials together. We were planning on just doing a private capital raise of 100 million or so. And our expectations around value from an Oakvale perspective, I won't speak for the Rush Street guys, was probably around 400 million. Phenomenal business. Richard and Greg and Matt and the team over there have done an incredible job. They built their platform. They've been basically preparing for real money gambling since 2014-15. So they built their PAM, they'd integrated Canby, and they'd started really doing well in certain core states, leveraging their omnichannel presence because they're connected to a few land-based casinos in Pennsylvania, Illinois. So they were on the tear. COVID then hit, and we all got a little bit freaked out and thought, well, should we put things on pause? So we didn't put anything on indefinite pause. We just delayed and watched. And then after three weeks, realized that actually there was enough capital in the market. But we kind of had a dual trap process where we were reviewing the private markets and we were reviewing the public markets. And at that point, because where the public markets were and how they were escalating, we took that route because it, it felt like the best way to access relatively cost-effective capital and also deliver what Rush Street wanted, which is access to further capital as they develop and grow the business and possibly the ability to go and do M&A with public equity and so on and so forth. So at that point, the, the SPAC route was a phenomenal route, a phenomenal platform to move relatively quickly, certainly faster than IPO, not as fast as doing a capital investment, but faster than IPO to get to market and accelerate the, uh, the business because you have access to a significant amount of capital and you know, pipe investments. And at that point, everyone was, there was a lot of hype, there was a lot of momentum investing and it was, it was very fast to raise capital. You didn't need to go too far afield. And I think it was really the right move for the business and it, it raised their profile, allowed them to do some interesting deals and so on and so forth. And also valuations were better than the private markets, quite significantly so. And yes, there's a sort of liquidity uplift or liquidity premium, but also I think the public markets were just ascribing more value to tech-driven gaming companies. So that was the benefit of doing the SPAC. The disbenefit of doing the SPAC is, I think, what you were driving at, which is you the cost of it is slightly more than doing an IPO because you've got the warrants. And so the warrants will, they invest at a certain level. So the trust investors have, you know, whether it's 0.5 of a warrant, point five a share, I should say, that will vest at eleven fifty and you can change the threshold. So that's that's more dilutive for existing investors or exist, existing shareholders. So that's the downside is you have some diluted can instruments. Can you describe like how but, dilutive you know, the, the Rush Street deal was? It, look, what I would say is these days pro, uh, and the IPO IPO market's probably not even supporting yeah. IPOs at the moment, but a SPAC is probably about two to three x the cost. And by of cost, because how much does uh, does a spec cost in dollars? It's it's such a hard question to answer because it depends on the so the lower the price or the value of the target, actually the more dilutive it is because you have a certain number of shares in the sponsor. And so you want to make sure that the rule of thumb was always if you had, uh, let's say, 200 million in the trust, at a minimum, you want to go for a, the, uh, an asset that is three times that value. So 200 million in the trust, minimum 600 million. Now there's a lot more flexibility because sponsors are forfeiting shares and it, it's much harder. I think we've seen, we've gone full circle. It's incredible to me how, you know, there was all this excitement, there was this launch of a huge number of SPACs on the back of the excitement and now a lot of them are expiring without having found deals because private companies are less excited about doing SPACs. I still think there's a place for them, very much so. I think it's a really good route to the public markets just as long as you can negotiate the right terms with the SPAC. And, and SPACs are getting cheaper 
for private companies that want to sell into it, but you need to be of a certain scale. And let's face it, there aren't that many billion dollar plus gaming, sports, businesses out there. So you've mm. got quite a limited pool. But I think this is where it's important to be really creative. And so possibly merging a couple of entities and thinking about it. Like so going back to the example to you gave, you said you like finger in the air value, not finger in the air, with your army of consultants. Uh, drinking uh, Pret coffee, um, came out with a valuation of 400 million for Rush Street, yes? <laughs> so it was, so at the front of the process, we thought it was about 400. We then, the business started growing so fast, prompted a little bit by COVID because all the land-based operations were shut, but it started to escalate. So our private valuation started going up pretty significantly, but the ultimate SPAC valuation was so, 1.8 million. Is, like if I raise a hundred million at a billion pre, it's it's whatever percent dilution. Is it the same in the spec? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's very similar, but then you have to factor in the sponsor equity and right. the warrants, right. which are so already a, in existence. That's a crazy but, swing to go from four hundred to one point eight. Well, firstly, the company grew really aggressively and was just okay. performing incredibly well and continues to do so, and so. It's not just, that's not the difference between, it wasn't 400 versus 1.8. I think the private valuation probably was north of a billion by the time we got there. And also the comparables just evolved really favorably as well. You had DraftKings just on the tear and just continuing to grow and just in a complete bull market and riding that wave. And likewise, there were a number of other gaming assets. And remember also, that DraftKings was the first listed real money gambling asset in the US and Gold Nugget and Rush Street came next. So you had a small set. So these were relatively unique opportunities that investors wanted to get into. I'm looking at the share price of Rush right now on July 28th. It's uh, 1.2 billion. The share price is 560 something. Does that, does that mean it's like below the, can you think about the $10 share price? It's sort of, 50% haircut on the on the SPAC price. Is that the right way to think about it? That That's right. So it right. is. So, that is exactly so with your right. banker hat on, so, like what's, maybe you could describe to the audience in a little bit of detail what's going on in the industry in terms of valuations and stock prices and things like that. So I think there was a, of course the macro hasn't helped. And there's been a run to profitability across the board, not just in gaming. I think the problem for gaming was that everything was being valued on next year's revenue in North America and almost legitimately so because you had this template once you started to get traction in one state and you had market access deals in another and you knew they were going to launch the following year, you could make an assumption about market share. I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I think in the US there are certain operators in different markets like maybe a San Manuel in California when that opens because of their land-based penetration, strength of brand, budget, exposure, might be, well, be a lot better positioned in California than they would in another state if they chose to launch in another state. So, you know, there are lots of different factors, but we know from sports betting that you tend to gravitate towards oligopolistic structures, and we can see that in the US with Bandu and DraftKings and, the, and um, Barstool, Best MGM, etc. that they're the dominant players and Rush Street open in that category as well, more, more so on the online casino side. But, you know, my feeling is that at that time, everyone was so hyped about the total addressable market size of gaming that they were valuing on the future potential. So there was a lot of upside potential baked into these valuations. It was all on next year's revenue. And I think the companies that were successful, like Rush Street, actually, had more of a bridge between this year's revenue and next year's. It wasn't just a hockey stick that suddenly just emerged out of nowhere. There was actually a bridge between the actuals and the forecasted revenues. And that's why I think Rushry executed and delivered pretty effectively. Whereas there were other examples of companies, slightly smaller businesses that were trying to SPAC, maybe were unsuccessfully SPAC, uh, trying to SPAC, that were saying, well, next year we'll do 180 million. We're worth a billion. And so... The tide went out a little bit and suddenly there was a, a push back to, well, what are you actually doing and where's your pathway to profitability? And that's 
that's kind of what I've seen is now it's all about fundamentals and it's about EBITDA and EBITDA multiples. And I think the gaming market is massively undervalued right now. Um, and my feeling is that it will come back strong. Gaming, I know it's kind of trussed out all the time, but it does tend to be relatively recession proof, not entirely. But we're seeing Latin America continuing to grow as a market. We're seeing India on the skill based side, subject to the shake out the tax, becoming a really intriguing market with Mobile Premier League, Winzo, Barzi Poker, all these businesses run by phenomenal management teams that have cutting edge technology and essentially created these real money skills businesses. So there's a lot of growth all over the place. I think the key is how quickly some of these companies can get to profitability and just riding out the, the macro storm. Because uh, you've got to look at bets on other businesses like that and say they can't be, they can't be worth so what they're worth. Just, just going back to Rush Street, and I know you don't work at Rush Street, and, and I'm just using them as, because I think they're quite of a, they're a good example in the industry because you know, they spacked and they're, they're a major player and all that. Good. So, uh, you know, yeah. they're not a profitable company. Is that right? As far as I understand. No, they're not, but I, they're not, but they're, they're nearer break even than all their peers. And their, their shtick was always, and continues to be that they acquire profitably and state by state. It's all about making sure that they're not just burning marketing dollars right. for the sake of stealing market share. So they're a more pragmatic. Are there any profitable gaming to, companies in the US that you know of? So gaming companies in the US that are profitable. That's a very good question. So Golden Nuggets, obviously points better not. Bet MGM are targeting profitability Aren't we all? next year or the year after, I think. <laughs> Isn't that funny though all? that it's exactly. sort of like you know, you think gaming, gambling, it's big money, big markets, you know, and nobody's making money in this in this in the US, which is yeah. Well, apart from the suppliers, right? So, and the media companies and affiliates. If you look at a lot of the affiliates, there's some great affiliates that are making huge amounts of money. So, the picks and shovels are working quite well. It's the the betting operators because of the cost of licensing certification, then the marketing dollars and the arms race that's happening as everyone's trying to steal market share. And then you look at New York, and I mean, the tax rate's so high that before you even start it, and I think there's you know, sport, sports betting is hard without real scale to be profitable. Look at, look at Europe. Look at the local champions in Europe. You know, Poland, STS, which we were actually involved in IPM for Christmas. That's a very good business and profitable business. But then if you go further down the rankings beyond the podium of STS, Fortuna, and others like that, then most of the operators outside of those three yeah are really unprofitable. So I don't think it's just an American phenomenon. I think America's harder because state by state. So just just to wrap up the SPAC conversation, can you summarize real quickly what the advantage of a, of a SPAC over an IPO is and, and why Rush didn't just do an IPO? I, I mean, it's changing. So in today's environment, I'm, Rush Street wouldn't have done a SPAC, I don't think. Um, I don't, they wouldn't have done an IPO though. So maybe I should use today's lens um, and we'll look through, through the prism of 2020 and 21. Um, but the reason for doing this back then is pricing was good. The access to capital was very favorable, so it wasn't too dilutive. And it was faster than an IPO. And you had price certainty on your valuation. So that was locked in. Whereas with an IPO... And the reason you wouldn't do a private capital raising is because you, you get all the... Uh, well. A, the valuation you said was a little bit better, and B, um, you get all the access to the public capital markets, right? Yeah, got it. So as somebody that, uh, you know, grew up on, on the right side of the pond but has done a lot of stuff on the left side of the pond, what, what, you know, you were just, we were talking about companies that aren't profitable um, in the U.S. What's your take on the, on the market? You said, you said a provocative statement that you think gambling is massively undervalued. Um, do you want to unpack that a little bit? Ooh. I just think that I guess it's partly my job to hype up the market, but uh, <laughs> no, look, I think gambling has been around forever and will continue to be around irrespective of regulatory changes, 
I think it's becoming more and more responsible, more and more data driven, and it's good to continue to see innovation across the board. But my feeling is that companies that are very cash flow generative and that are growing and have a total addressable market size that's escalating. So perfect example, I'd take Betson. You know, they are they announced that they're performing incredibly well in Latin America. LATAM is a market that now, in the last year or so, is starting to step up. Finally, everyone's been talking about it for six or seven years, and you know, there's probably only a few examples of really successful companies in LATAM, like Caliente, um, possibly some of the Colombian operators, and obviously Betfu and Sporting Bet did well in, in Brazil. Um, we sold a business called Incubet, which was pretty successful in Peru. But really up until the last year to two years, most businesses have struggled with payments, with the affiliate networks not being particularly developed. And so now what we're seeing is a few standout performers in local Latin markets and the Brazilian market's about to, or we hope, is going to regulate in the next 12 to 18 months. It's certainly getting closer than it's ever been. So if you're a bets on and you're valued on a single did low single digit EV bit da. That doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me, given that you're really cash flow generative, you're growing, you're well positioned for new markets to open up, and you know they've just done a deal in, in Africa. Again, that's a relatively big market, complex market. So I just think there's lots of growth opportunities for these businesses, and therefore, you know, the valuation metrics don't necessarily reflect fair value. But I think they'll come back and got to remember that there is a macro pressure as well at the same time and the cost of capital is going up and also ESG the other thing is ESG in Sweden and the Nordics responsible gambling um, well not just responsible gambling but corporate social responsibility and obviously gambling doesn't tick that box so ESG stands for environmental social what's your take on the American market so, do you think it's like lived up to the hype but like above like going faster than you expected, slower than you expected? Uh, well, definitely online casino regulation has slowed down massively. Um, and I think you go back to your question about profitability of American companies. I think there'd be a lot more profitable companies if online casino had launched in more states. But has it lived up to the hype? I think there was a lot of misunderstanding. You'll see that from all the revised TAM estimates. Because a lot of what was happening, I think, is... People were looking at the UK market as the benchmark, but actually the composition of the UK market is very different with horse racing, different sports, American football versus, I'd say right soccer, to say it. it pains me to you say said it soccer. pretty well. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, they're different sports with different margins. And so when you're trying to calculate GGR, benchmarking against the UK market or the European market, just not a like for like comparison. So I think. Some of the TAM estimates were probably a little bit overblown. They've been curtailed a little bit. Um, obviously, there was a lot around the convergence of media and betting. Don't think there have been that many successful examples of betting and media working hand in hand um, or hand in glove. And I think Barstool is a really good example of how it's worked. But of course, that comes with challenges as well. And some of the other big media deals probably yet to deliver at the level of expectation. So I think you could argue that it hasn't yet delivered up to the hype, and but there's still a long way to go and there's still lots of exciting companies. What I love about you know the US opening up is it's opened up this whole world of entrepreneurs that are setting up different types of products that are pretty innovative. And then you've got some of the daily fantasy and, and sweepstakes businesses. Like, so Underdog recently announced a big capital raise. They're doing a phenomenal job. I think their product is really top notch. And then you've got the, the likes of Prize Picks and Fliff, who are growing really fast as well in, in the market. And they're able to operate in, I think it's 38 states in the US because they're either sweepstakes or they're fantasy. So there's there's a lot of in, interesting innovative companies, and I so I, it, it will get that for sure. Yeah. Just tee up a provocative uh, statement for your for your comment. I mean, you you know, you have an investment banking background. I kind of I think of myself as a techie, 
And one of the big shortcomings I see in the industry is almost all the companies you named, um, and, and please uh, argue with me if you don't agree, that I don't think they have like consumer internet DNA. I think they're largely big companies that are better at entertainment, marketing, um, you know, the pizzazz, if you like, like Barstool's, like it's not a tech company. Penn National's not a tech company. Um, Rush, I would even argue, is not a tech company. FanDuel is not a tech company. So, like, I think that, I think in the context of, like, the opportunities there, the market's there, people want to open their wallets to do sports betting, that opportunity's there. But I don't see the right kind of company exploiting it. And I think that it's largely kept back because of the regulation is too onerous to be a small startup with five guys and try to do something in the space. So I think the valuations are more limited by the the right people working on this problem or not. Um, I think I'm 50-50 on that statement. Spoken I like a true banker. A lot of the companies you mentioned. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want a cat or a dog, Stanford? I'll sit on the fence. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, both. So, so I definitely agree that regulation stifles. Yeah. It is. It, it has to be there, but it is very innovation stifling because you can come up with amazing ideas and amazing concepts, but it's so hard to scale them because you have to spend millions before you can even launch your product, and that's why actually. You know, I love doing, I love working in the free to play mobile games environment because actually you can build a social casino or a social solitaire product or, you know, something like a coin master and suddenly you can build a multi-billion dollar business without having to raise hundreds of millions. And that's been the biggest challenge in the US is everyone's just got to raise so much money and there's a real fear of it becomes about a marketing arms race and you're just trying to throw as much in as possible. And so I do think some have really focused on product and tech and done a great job. But I also think just the nature of the requirements means you can't be as agile and flexible like um, a new age tech company or a Web3 company because you just cannot implement these things fast enough because they all need to be tested, certified, and so on and so forth. So it, it does create constraints. The other thing that probably keep, uh, creates some constraints is reliance on third party providers. And so when your tech stack has a bunch of other platform, you're reliant on a platform provider or a sports betting provider, you're not entirely in control. So a lot of what people have done is use businesses like Shape Games where they consume the APIs of the sports book and then bespoke the front end. And that's where you get most differentiation. But so I do think, I mean, I look at uh, Rush has been the prevailing example throughout. So but I do think actually they would consider themselves a tech and a product company. But correct me if like I'm wrong. They just can't they be for built the a huge. They do, they do. But just because they use one third party for something that's highly technical doesn't mean they don't have a huge amount of technology that wraps mm. around that, both at the front end and the back end. And if you think about these systems, they're banking systems. I mean, you know, you've built you've built the whole system yourself and invested huge amounts of money in building it. But it's not it's not easy. And then, you know, to your point about are they more marketing companies or are they more tech? I think over the last 15 years, you would consider that the big operators have been almost more marketing companies and all about building brands. That feels like it's changing with, with a few of the newer players. But yeah, so uh, diplomatic responses, I personally don't think there's enough real innovation in the gaming space. Yeah. I totally, because of I totally some of the agree reasons we've referenced. I, I but I do think some, yeah. I mean, I always get a bit depressed when you go to ICE yeah. and you see the same old thing. And actually what you want to see is some super interesting products. But what I think, it, what I do see is people innovating within themes. So whether it's Future Anthem, innovating within slots by collecting data, more granular data, and then allowing for more insights or it's one of the companies like a shape that's creating this customer engagement layer. There are some pretty intriguing companies out there. But also, I love all of the new free-to-play businesses like Incentive Games that I think are creating really nice sticky products um, for operators. So there are tools. For uh, one of my big uh, business theses, theses, thesis, I, 
thesis, one of my big business and that points of view right, is that it? price should be really <laughs> a, a, a dominating factor. You were talking about the difference in margin between soccer and horse racing or American football, for example. Like, do you believe, do you agree that price will increasingly, do you think margins will get compressed as the industry matures, or do you think that there will kind of be this natural level around five, six, seven percent on singles? And... So the answer depends on tax, because in some markets where you have turnover tax, you forget about pricing. It's, you know, like Poland, France, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it's not a battleground. In the UK, where you have more sophisticated betters, I think pricing is really important. And you have odds checker, all these really well-known sites that make pricing much more of a factor. I, when I think about the US right now, maybe it's a little unfair, but I think it's more important to have really good usability and UI versus pricing. But if you want to pull a lot of the US black market into the white market, you're going to have to have low juice, pinnacle style sports books. So I can see how pricing will get more compressed in the US market. At the moment, I don't think there's that many books that are taking huge amounts of action from those sharp players. So as they get a little bit more sophisticated and accept that play, and as more of these punters or betters move from the dot-com market to the white market, then you may see and margins. I mean, it's no secret market. that the market has, uh, I mean, across all industries has dried up, or at least a lot of people are quote-unquote risk-off right now. Um, have you seen like deal flow and all that kind of stuff sort of really slow to a halt, or are things still moving in the industry? No, what I would say is, there's always M and A. If you're talking about M and A, um, there's always M and A for opportunities for good companies. So I actually we're busier than ever right now. Yes, it's not as easy to get these things across the line. You have to be more creative and you have to push harder. But and the cost of capital has gone up, which means financing is a little less accessible. But I think for high quality assets, there are a number of acquirers out there that are taking much more long-term views rather than being reactive to the market and that's the smart way to be right now you know what's that famous warren buffett expression about be greedy when other people are, are nervous and i think you know you'll see a number of the bigger operators that have access to capital doing strong and very effective deals in this environment and they should do because it's less expensive than it was a year ago. I think we'll see more private equity getting into the space, maybe more on the B2B side. But right now, I'm seeing a lot of action within real money for high quality, profitable assets. Less, less so for assets that are break even or losing money. But if they've got a certain growth profile, then there's still considerations for that. And if they're in a, a, a market or they're a local champion, then I think that's very compelling. Um, and then in the mobile game space, that's also been hit quite hard. And in the sports space, that you can see from the Chelsea deal, there's, these football clubs seem to be relatively recession-proof. You could argue that a big part of their sponsorship is coming from the gaming world. Let's see how that evolves with the, the white paper in the UK. And you know, we're working on a Formula One deal at the moment, and it seems like Formula One is going from strength to strength, and the SPN are paying 18 times more than they did a year ago for the rights in the US for Formula One with Drive to Survive. So I think the tailwinds are good awesome. for real money gambling. Before we go, what do you want to be projects. when you grow up? <laughs> Retired. <laughs> um, what do I want to be when I grow up? That is a good question. I quite love what I'm doing right now. So I, I wouldn't want to wish for something else. But, and I'm really enjoying, you know, the investment side of things and just seeing lots of innovative opportunities. So we'll, we'll see how that evolves. But awesome. right, right now, well, thank you loving, so much for joining. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. And I, I, I think the audience will like uh, the, the explainer you gave on the SPAC and your perspective on the industry. So, or oh, totally confused. Or they'll just be totally confused. <laughs> don't don't reach out That's if you're balance confused. Sheet. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>